effects of long-term storage on semiconductor components for military and aerospace applications, brought to you by Military and Aerospace Electronics and sponsored by Rochester Electronics in Newburyport, Massachusetts. I'm John Keller, Chief Editor of Military and Aerospace Electronics. In today's consumer-driven society, many semiconductor original components component manufacturers are moving to shorter product life cycles. However, the military and aerospace industries may require equipment to be operational for decades, not just years, which makes continuity of supply uh, a significant challenge. Store, storing semiconductor components for extended periods after final production is one widely practiced solution. When long-term component storage is a requirement, it is important for the customer to have confidence that stored components are reliable in the field. This webinar will explore how long-term storage is a viable option for continuity of supply based on a detailed analysis of component solderability, mechanical integrity, and electrical test. Our presenters today are Dan Dice, Vice President of Design Technology at Rochester Electronics, and Peter Crudelli, Manager of Manufacturing Quality Assurance at Rochester Electronics. First, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please submit it to the questions window in our and our technical expert will help you out. We recommend disabling any pop-up blocking software or extensions in your browser, as these can cause issues with the webinar player. We welcome your questions during today's event, and we will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation. But please feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your question into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. Finally, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Military and Aerospace Electronics website within the next 24 hours. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. So let's get started with Dan Dice, Vice President of Design Technology at Rochester Electronics. Dan? Thank you, John. I appreciate everyone taking the time out of their day to uh, join us today to talk about the uh, effects of long-term storage on semiconductor components. I want to give you a little bit of background first uh, on some of what Rochester has, what some of Rochester does, and, and lead that into Peter Crudelli, who will talk about the details of our analysis. This webinar is really based on two papers that we've put out there for you to download, and I think they're in the content here of the of the webinar. We talk about long-term storage, focusing on component solderability, manufacture or mechanical integrity, and electrical test. You know, there are the topics we want to cover are really trends in manufacturing and life cycles, which have brought us to this point of talking about long-term storage. Uh, some options that are there for extending component availability. And Peter's going to go through key areas of concern, the results in, uh, in our testing, and then we'll end it with a summary and QA. When you look at the market share life cycle requirements by industry, it's, it's no surprise to see that consumer and computing uh, communications are driving the demand for semiconductors. Uh, these are uh, these applications have short lifetimes, typically less than seven years, and they drive all of the product definition, all of the product lifetime, uh, life cycles that you see out there. The industry is really trending or tending towards shorter life cycles. Uh, it used to be, you can go back and look in the 80s, you can look in the 90s, and you can see that the lifetime of components back then is much longer than what they are right now. I think the world stayed around five volts for a very long time, and then 3.3 .3 volts, and these are on the digital side of things, of course. Uh, 
but if you look at how long things were at five volts and then how long they were at 3.3 volts and then dropping down to two and a half for a little while, then 1.8, then 1.2 and so forth, it all starts to shrink up as far as how long products are gonna be available. And that's a, that's a continuing trend that we'll, we'll continue to see. However, as John stated at the front of the call, mill aero industry continues to require long lifetimes, uh, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, 10 years is really too soon, but 20 or 30 years, not uncommon at all. In addition, as uh, if you look at what the US market is today or, or supply side, if you look at who the uh, component manufacturers are in the US and who's US based foundries, about 2% of the products are used in military devices. Uh, the vast majority are, are COTS or commercial off the shelf devices. U.S. chip manufacturers represent only about 10% of the worldwide production. That's a volume of wafer um, and less than 5% of total OSATs, which are offshore or outsourced assembly and test. So what's happened is it, this has created a huge dilemma for the mill aero industry. But if you, you look at it, everything is kind of offshored, uh, not just the silicon, but also the assembly and the test. So you've got some options that are are, are not very uh, favorable, but uh, these are the biggest, the most popular options for extending con continuity of supply. You got last time by and in-house long-term storage. How much do you know what that is or how much is your budget to be able to do that? If you're on a two-year budget cycle for military, you're not gonna be typically able to do that. Uh, it's the most expensive, but it is, you are going to get the parts and they are going to be there. Second option is to work with a licensed manufacturer who is authorized to continue component supply. And when I say authorized, I mean AS6496 authorized, not just somebody has the parts and some of their lines are authorized, but a, but a truly authorized source of supply. Uh, there are multiple options available. Uh, it's exact, exactly the same component. Um, and again, 100% authorized is, is a very different thing than partially authorized. And then your purchase of long-term components from an authorized distributor, uh, your, your, your ability to, you can, you can certainly get that in a cost-effective way, um, but you need to ensure that they are authentic and reliable. And those are two different topics we could talk about another time. And Rochester Electronics, of course, can help. Our, our solutions for extending end of life are really, you know, if, if you look at our inventory of product today, how many finished goods we have in the warehouse, it's pretty shocking how many are active parts. It, we actually have several billion active products in the warehouse today. That's a surprise to some, everyone thinks, oh no, they're only carrying end of life, but no, we have active product in the warehouse. It's active past uh, what what uh, typically out of date code is what uh, what the popular uh, nomenclature is, but we're, we're gonna talk into that a lot further. So we're automotive certified now, uh, ITF 16949, and, and that's quite something. That means your entire company has changed how we handle things, how we operate, and it also puts our, our quality system on par with the best. We have multiple options for manufacturing or continue to manufacture product. We have a, a place where we can start. Of course, we have the finished goods, but then we also have wafers that we have stored. We have uh, several billion die under storage. And then we have what my group does, and that's starting with design databases. And, and we have many successful uh, products that we've brought back to life uh, that is essentially fully authorized from the original manufacturer, take their database, move it to another fab, uh, and, and declare that the product is identical. And uh, there's a whole methodology around that, but that is another option for extending the life of a product. 
If you look at our manufacturing services that help extend the life, and that'll lead into what Peter's going to be talking about, there's there's design and product replication, which my group does. There's wafer processing and storage, assembly, test services, reliability, and, and IP archiving. Our design engineering teams are, are in Rockville, Maryland, in Burnsville, Minnesota. We're, I'm blessed with about 350 years of experience in the group. Um, very, very uh, experienced group uh, team that um, focuses on making sure uh, uh, our end products drop into customer systems, no change in software, and most of the time they don't have to change their boards either. There are a couple different options we choose here, replication being one of them. Uh, that's more or less a product clone. And again, everything I'm talking about here is fully authorized. This is with 100% authorized from the original manufacturer. So I'm not off cloning products without authorization from the original rights holder. So we have a long history of investment in hermetic assembly and, and we're gonna continue that uh, and we have continued that in plastic assembly. That's also another option for extending the life of a product. And if you take a look, we've, we've got all of these uh, products that are very famous in the, in the military market for typically a higher temperature drives use of hermetic assemblies. And we've been doing this for uh, upwards of 10 years now for hermetic assembly. We also have wafer dye storage services and, and, and really we have dye ranging all the way from two inch wafer up to 12 inch wafer under storage. And, and again, that, that dye has been under storage since 1968, so the oldest of it, and still reliable in real time monitoring. And we make sure that it's still manufacturable as well. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Crudelli, who's going to get into the details of our study. Peter? Thank you, Dan. Um, my name is Peter Crudelli. I'm the Manufacturing Quality Manager here at Rochester Electronics. Uh, again, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy day to, to spend with us on this webinar. Today we're going to be going over the most common concerns in regards to age components, starting with date codes, tin whiskers, oxidation, solderability, mechanical integrity, uh, followed by electrical performance. We'll be reviewing the work performed by my colleagues, as well as going over some guidelines on handling and various white papers uh, published by some of the other OCMs out there. So when we talk about date codes, date codes originated in the 1940s as a means to provide traceability through the manufacturing or seal date. Uh, knowing the seal date provides the manufacturer the ability to, to go back and identify, here was the process of record, here was the uh, bill of materials. Um, it provides that full backwards traceability. <clears throat> so what ended up happening is that several um, companies and standards started using date codes to restrict procurement of devices. Uh, MIL PRF 38535 is an example that had previously required components past a certain age to go through revalidation testing prior to use. The consensus is that the date codes aren't necessarily a good indicator of component quality. Uh, indications supporting this is that in 1995, there was updates to several of the, the mill specifications uh, to modify these restrictions on, on date codes. Mill PRF 38535 now states that uh, components only need to be solderable per uh, test method 2003 of mill standard 883. And Mill PRF 19500 has uh, a clause in it that actually says that acquisition documents should not restrict procurement based on date code and it also requires parts to be solderable uh, though to a different test method uh, 2026 per mill standard 750 uh, due to them being uh, discrete components. Uh, 
I'm sure most of the folks on the, the call have heard of or are familiar with the term uh, tin whiskers. Uh, the term tin whiskers is a, a little misleading in the fact that it applies to, to more than just tin. Uh, it could be tin alloys, uh, pure cadmium or, or zinc as well. Uh, these can result in hair-like crystalline structures growing out of the grain boundary, and they can grow to several millimeters in length or longer. Uh, the, the risk here is they have the potential to cause shorts, or additionally, they could cause uh, what is known as a, a metal vapor arc. Basically, this is where the, the, the metal heats to the point where it becomes ionized and provides a potential path for large amounts of current to flow into a de device. Um, resulting in catastrophic damage. Tin whiskers also grow unpredictably. As far as the, the causes of tin whiskers go, uh, NASA has done extensive research on the, the topic. Uh, a lot of good information can be found on their, their website. A couple of the conclusions that they've had is that a single accepted explanation for the mechanisms of tin whiskers has not been established and that the growth rate is highly variable and likely to be determined by a complex relationship of factors. Uh, if anyone is interested in more information on tin whiskers and associated testing, uh, JSD A121 is a, a good reference. So what do you do if you have parts that you're concerned about tin whiskering? Well, one option is to perform solder dipping um, using uh, 6337 tin lead. Uh, Rochester Electronics does have this capability in-house. Uh, we are QML certified. This may not be an option depending on your package outline or lead pitch as the solder dip thickness tends to be greater than that of say, you know, a solder plate. <clears throat> Another option is that we do have an extensive dye bank and if we were to manufacture components uh, for an end user, they could potentially select the, the lead finish that's utilized uh, based on availability. So on these next few slides, I'd like to go into some of the tools and methodologies that were used in our study, as well as some of the studies and guidelines that we'll be referencing. Rochester does have in-house capability for soldering to dip and lick and surface mount, as well as MSL characterization. We are DLA certified for mill standard 883 uh, 5004 screening and 5005 QCI. We also have the capability to test to an array of JetX specs as well as AEC Q100, which is primarily used by automotive customers. We're working on bringing IGA or internal gas analysis in house this year. Having uh, all these tools at our disposal uh, allows us to provide a, a wide array of testing without needing to go outside. This helps us process material quickly and reduces overall cycle time. Rochester also has extensive in-house FA capabilities. For the point of this study, some of these methodologies utilized were SEM, x-ray and cross-sectioning. We did utilize an independent test lab for this uh, study to eliminate any potential concern due to bias. Should we ever use, uh, decide to evaluate um, MSL characterization, we do have in-house CSAM capability as well. Uh, a key item of note is that our design group, um, led by Dan Dice, who was nice enough to run us through the, the history, uses these same tools in their recreation process and material evaluations. The, the last part of the tools and capabilities that I'd like to go over, uh, and this, is, this will come into play when we talk about one of the later phases of our study, is our internal test capability. 
Rochester Electronics has over 16 major ATE or automated test platforms that allows us to test, test a, a wide variety of technologies ranging from digital, analog, uh, power, uh, and mixed signal devices. Uh, this includes wafer probe. Uh, <clears throat> we do have handling capabilities for a wide array of package outlines, as well as the ability to test from minus 60 C to plus 200 degrees C. We do also maintain our own internal electrical and mechanical CAD design group, uh, as well as supporting in-house repair for ATE or, or boards. Now, on to our evaluation plan for the, the study and white papers that have been published. Uh, it, it really breaks down to, to three phases with the, the first phase looking at solderability. We populated a PCB with randomly selected aged components and inspected them to industry standard IPCA 610 criteria. The second phase involved mechanical integrity uh, with decapsulation, cross-sections, uh, SEM analysis, followed by X-ray. And uh, the last phase here, phase three, is looking at uh, electrical performance to data sheet limits. Uh, this image here is a, a schematic of the, the board that we use for this study. Uh, we'll see a populated example shortly. So as part of phase one, the solderability testing of components, we randomly selected 57 lots and date codes uh, out of inventory. These ranged from three to 16 years old and uh, encompassed an array of lead finishes from matte tin, uh, tin lead, and nickel palladium gold. Uh, we covered a variety of package types as well from PLCs these, to TSOPs and uh, SOICs. As far as the assembly process goes, we utilized a standard reflow for um, lead-free lead finishes. We used a lead-free uh, solder paste with a peak reflow of 245 degrees C, and the nominal time through the reflow oven was approximately four and a half minutes. Uh, this is an actual graphical representation of the reflow uh, through the furnace. Looking at the solder joints uh, for some of these components, the, the first example we'll look at will be a 28 lead PLCC. This device has a matte tin lead finish. And in this SEM image on the left here, we see good wetting of the solder and good capillary action up the lead. This device passes IPCA 610 criteria as the, the wetting along the pad is greater than two times the lead width and up the heel is greater than the lead width plus solder thickness. The, the x-ray image on the right shows consistency along that edge of the package as far as the solder joint goes in wetting and capillary action up the lead. So the, the key takeaway to these images is that uh, any potential concern related to oxidation buildup um, has not diminished the ability of these components to solder. The, the, the key difference between our study and some of the other studies that you may have read is that a lot of those looked at solderability testing only, whereas we populated uh, an FR4 PCB board. FR4 being the most commonly used out in the industry, but the, the thought process here was let's replicate an end use application, um, a real world application uh, for our, our end users here, as opposed to relying on just solderability testing alone. This next device is a 14 lead TSOP. Uh, lead finish here varies and is nickel palladium gold. On the SEM image on the left-hand side, we also see good wetting across the pad 
and good capillary action up the heel of the device. This also passes IPCA 610 inspection criteria as it is uh, greater than three times the lead width on the pad and the fillet extends to greater than the lead width plus the um, solder height, solder thickness, I should say. Again, this, this X-ray image on this side of the package shows consistency in the solderability of the leads. So again, this is what we would want to see. This is another clear indication that any concern due to oxidation has not negatively impacted uh, the component's ability to solder in a real world application. <clears throat> on this slide, we'll be reviewing the overall PCB results from the independent lab. Uh, you can see the populated board here that covers an array of package outlines, including from uh, PLCCs to SOICs and TSOPs and uh, a wide array of other package types. Uh, these did all vary in lead finish from nickel, palladium, gold, and matte tin. The assessment from the independent lab was uh, looking at a 100% X-ray followed by 100% inspection to IPCA 610, followed by an automated optical inspection, and then finally a final board inspect. Their, their assessment was that there were no defects detected. So uh, the key takeaway here is that age components in a real world application uh, were assembled and inspected to board mount industry standards and methodologies and they showed no manufacturing issues or defects using components that were stored, stored up to 16 years. So any, any concerns related to potential oxidation or age did not inhibit the ability of these parts to solder in a real world application. We'll move on to phase two of the study now, which is going to look at the mechanical integrity testing that was performed. Out of the 57 date codes or, or lots that were assembled onto the uh, FR4 PCBs, uh, we took a sample and uh, cross-sectioned, x-rayed, and send, semmed them uh, using a independent lab. Uh, we covered a, a wide array of lead finishes and package types, ranging from matte tin, to nickel, palladium, gold, PLCCs, and TSOPs with components from 4 to 14 years old. The first device we'll look at here is a uh, TSOP that has been cross-sectioned. The X-ray image on the right uh, shows the, the bond wires. And if you look at that closely, there is no indication of any damage to the bond wires or breakage or any sort of lifting off the pad. The, the SEM image on the right is uh, very revealing regarding the mechanical integrity. So the, the key points to look at here is any potential interface delamination between the mold compound and corresponding features. So when we look at the top of the die to the mold compound, the mold compound to the, the edge of the die attached fillet, or the bottom of the paddle, the lead frame itself, and even the bond wires, there is no indication of any sort of delamination. This indicates that the long-term storage of these components has not impacted the mechanical integrity of the devices. And this is after reflow, so any sort of thermal stresses due to the reflow process, if there was an issue, you would expect to see something here. Key takeaway is that no defects were observed using both X-ray and SEM imaging. On this next slide, we'll be looking at the construction analysis of a 28 lead PLCC. Uh, again, on the left-hand side, we see uh, an X-ray with a detailed view of the bond wires to the bond pads. There is no indication of any sort of bond wire damage from the lead fingers to the bond pads. 
there is no indication that any of the bond wires are, are lifting. This SEM image is more of a close up than the previous one we looked at, but we can clearly see the interfaces of the mold compound to the top of the die, the fillets of the die attach adhesive, the bottom of the paddle, and to the wires. There is no indication of any sort of delamination to, to any of these interfaces. Additionally, if we look at the, the ball bonds, there's no indication of any lifting, uh, cracking, or any other sort of delamination uh, on that interface as well. To reiterate, the key takeaway here is that no defects were observed from X-ray and SEM imaging, and that the age of the components uh, was not impacted uh, as far as mechanical integrity goes. This slide is a post-encapsulation of a gold ball bond. On the image on the right, we can clearly see the, the gold wire and ball bond to the die pad. Uh, there is no indication of any sort of lifting, damage to bond wires, or any other sort of wire defects. The image on the right is a close-up of a, a ball bond. We can see the mold compound and its fillers and, and, and resin content on the right very clearly. Uh, there is no indication of any sort of delamination from the wire to the mold compound. And if we look closely at the ball bond to bond pad interface, there is no indication of any uh, lifting or cracking on that interface as well. All devices were found to be free of cracking, delamination, and bond wire defects. Again, reiterating that uh, long-term storage did not have a, a negative impact on the mechanical integrity of these devices. <clears throat> Moving on to phase three of our study, uh, electrical testing. Um, th this is really where our study differs from a lot of the other ones that you may have uh, you know, seen. The previous studies, you know, didn't really include electrical test. You know, this could be due to a variety of, of issues or, or reasons, I should say. It could be that the LCM no longer has the test program, that the test platform is no longer supported, or worst case, the, the product could have gone end of life and is no longer supported um, due to, you know, shifting demands in the industry. For the, for the purpose of this testing, we selected three unique product types uh, with multiple date codes, and they covered uh, a wide variety of lead finishes from matte tin, tin lead, nickel palladium gold, uh, and the components ranged from three to 17 years in age. So for this electrical testing, the components we looked at were eight, 16, and 40 lead P-dips uh, and covered a range of technology types ranging from a digital controller, a one-time programmable memory, and a linear voltage regulator. These devices were all tested to their respective data sheet limits and they all yielded 100%. This is a, a clear indication that for these components, long-term storage did not impact the ability of the components to meet their data sheet specifications, emphasizing stability. Next, I'd like to briefly discuss work performed by other OCMs, the, the first of which would be uh, Allegro Microsystems. Uh, in their guidelines for handling, they took components that were stored at ambient conditions. Uh, these components had a matte tin lead finish and they performed wetting balance. Uh, so basically solderability testing on them. Uh, they concluded that the long-term storage does not affect solderability. And they also stated that the levels of oxidation accumulated from long-term storage did not adversely affect component solderability. Next, we'll move on to uh, two papers from Texas Instruments on component reliability after long-term storage. 
the, the first paper was issued in 2008 and looked at components that were aged up to 15 years old. <clears throat> they looked at solderability, uh, SEM, MSL characterization, and visual inspection after cross-sectioning. What they determined is there was no impact to solderability from freshly manufactured components. <clears throat> a follow-up paper in 2021 was also uh, published by Texas Instruments. In this paper, they expanded the variety of package types used, as well as the age of components that were up to 21 years old. They looked at uh, several reliability tests, including um, cross sections, SEM, They also use uh, the S1 JEDEC method for their solderability testing. The output of that paper in their determination is that there was no evidence of diminished reliability. The, the biggest thing out of that paper is the statement that, that Texas Instruments made with confidence is that TI will eliminate limitations on storage duration. So going forward, TI will no longer put a limit on how long they store products for. Next, I'd like to talk about some of our continued work and efforts uh, in terms of long storage. Right now, we're planning to expand the package style evaluation, uh, both in pin count and in larger package types. Uh, we plan to evaluate correlation to standard industry solderability predictors using both S1 and dip and look. And we also plan to expand electrical testing to include uh, additional package types um, and also evaluating functionality as a, a function of the reflow profile. So we plan on looking at baseline electricals, you know, simulating reflow of those devices, and then repeating uh, the electrical test at the, the end. Right now we're targeting a white paper for September of 2023 with a webinar uh, to be followed in October. On, on that note, I will turn the presentation back over to Dan Dice and uh, thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate the, uh, the detailed analysis that you guys all did when you, when you dug into that as far as uh, uh, people have concerns about long-term storage of product and we're not alone in that uh, saying that hey you know if if your if your contract manufacturer for your product has this date code limit uh, you know if you can prove that you're within the authorized channel that you've got good storage methods uh, we don't see that the typical old date code concerns of two years, three years, five years, whatever people are saying, um, is has any data to back it up. Uh, we're generating data, more data all the time. TI is generating data, Allegro is generating data. There are those people generating data that say that those date code concerns that are anywhere from two to five years uh, are simply without data. Uh, you can, you know, buying a semiconductor product is not like going to a grocery store in the produce market and worried about whether something is old or not. Uh, it's just not the same thing. Purchasing from authorized distributors, AS6496, I have to emphasize that again, it's an effective option to mitigate against unknown handling and storage found outside the authorized channel. Um, there are those that go out and they'll buy back excess and they'll mix with stuff that they bought through the authorized channel and they'll claim that they're coming to market with a great solution that's authorized. They're not 100% authorized. They're mixing and matching. They're taking pieces from outside the authorized channel. They're mixing it with authorized. That's not the same. You, That isn't the same storage. That's not the same thing as saying 100% authorized. And I, want to emphasize that again. 
We already talked about the date code restrictions. They're just not a good indicator. In fact, I'll challenge anybody who talks about date codes being two years to five years as being without data. Uh, and, and that's what we're coming to market with right now. We're saying we have data. Data says, no, you, you don't have concerns. You can, you can be concerned about solderability. You can ask for additional solderability checks or tests or whatever. All valid, fine, but the data we have says not going to be an issue. Uh, we've conducted detail analysis. We say that it's good for up to 17 years, no issues or failures, and we're going to continue the study, and we're not alone in that. So with that, I, I thank you very much. I want to turn it over to um, uh, John Keller, who is going to hit us up with some of your questions. Okay, well, thank you, Dan and Peter. <clears throat> now it's time to take questions and comments from our online audience. As a reminder, you can ask questions at any time, <clears throat> excuse me, um, via the ask a question box in the presentation window. If we're unable to get to your questions during the webcast, um, we'll do our best to reach out to you afterwards. So um, our first question uh, is, from our friends at IBM Canada, and that is, were all components tested to MSL1, and if not, did they need any moisture bakeout process before card attach? I think that question is for Peter, but um, I, I'm going to assume that many of the technical questions are for Peter, but Dan, please go ahead and chime in <laughs> on any question. No problem. <laughs> Uh, no, thank you. No, so that's a great question. Um, you know, based on the, the pin count of the devices, um, it'd be safe to assume that a lot of these were, were MSL3. Um, I don't have that information readily available. Um, I'll, I'll look at our notes here internally, but I'm sure that the, the subcontractor that we utilized, uh, you know, did their standard checks in accordance with J standard 33, looking at the uh, humidity indicator card. Uh, which would give an indication as to whether a bakeout was required. Um, so, you know, recommendation is always going to be there to to follow the industry standards as far as when a bake is required and when it's not. Um, so, you know, per MSL one, it would not require a bake per that standard. But okay, uh, question from uh, the Air Force Research Lab: uh, Does transfer from design archive? OCM intellectual property remain workable when targeted processes are obsolete? Yeah, I'll take that. Okay. Good question. Though, you know, and, and uh, you know, sometimes the, the answer is uh, no, that doesn't work out. Um, however, let's, let's jump back, take a look at one of the, one of the designs we uh, are in the middle of qual right now, but it was a, I'm going to call it a success because it works in the customer system and it passes the uh, the original test program. It was the MC6800. If you can imagine the MC6800, uh, if you got gray hair like me um, and and attended college in the 80s, uh, that might have been a lab board that you worked on was the 6800. Uh, the product was initially introduced in 1978, and we were able to create in that case it was a form fit function drop in replacement still in a 40 pin dip just like the original product but we tuned the io edge rates to match precisely in fact we kept it nmos and and so we're well aware of the original technology in that case it was pure nmos with depletion and buried contacts and all kinds of goofy on die tricks to jack the voltage up to eight so that the output voltage will look like five. And, and we're well aware of all these tricks. And, and in that case, we created a form fit function drop in that still is five volts that the customer can still use their board from the eighties and drop in. So in some cases we can overcome those challenges. And in some cases we absolutely cannot. Uh, a, a great example is a, a complicated power PC processor that was done on Global Foundry's uh, SOI 40 nan 45 nanometer process. Well, guess what? That thing is very tightly coupled to the original fab process, 
and you're not going to pick that up and move it to another fab process. That's simply not going to happen. And that's true with any design that you can possibly get an archive of doesn't mean it's a portable design. Flash memory, I'm going to make an argument that flash memory is not portable to another fab. It's tied to the fab process it was originally made on. But we've got a, a fair number of successes too. And if you go out to rockelect.com and you look under authorized um, authorized uh, solutions, you see the design. There's a, a product showcase there, which shows a couple hundred designs that we've done in the last uh, 15 years that I've been here anyway. So go ahead, John. Okay. Um, considering all requirements, all required long-term storage maintenance and testing methodologies, how much of all that contributes to the component price over a give, given period of time? Ah, okay. Well, clearly we're in business and have been for 40 some odd years. So I'm going to say that we've got a business model that makes sense and takes into account all that we do. But the other thing that we're able to do that a publicly traded company is not able to do very well anyway, is acquire inventory without knowing if we're actually ever going to sell it. And if you're a publicly traded company and you acquire inventory and you don't know if you're going to sell it, you get hammered. Uh, where a private company like Rochester Electronics were able to do these uh, speculative um, inventory accumulations and, and account for it in our business model. So we account for all of that. We, we are continuing to be in business. We're continuing to grow. So something must be working uh, for that to be the case. But yes, we account for all of that. In cases where a customer comes to us and they want us to perform the storage for them, that's going to be a whole separate business by itself. That isn't something that is part of the greater Rochester business necessarily, but we do that as well. We have we have product under cage code control or cage in cages uh, for specifically handled for customers to dole out in whatever way they see fit. And they're paying us to properly store that product and distribute it over time to whoever they want it to go to. That is maybe their contract manufacturer or something like that. So uh, yes, I mean, there, of course the money is buried in there somewhere for us to be able to do all this. Um, but we think it's a pretty fair uh, trade-off to be able to extend the life of products for multiple decades too, past when the original manufacturer was there. Okay. Um, do you think that moisture plays a part in formation of tin whiskers and what are the implications there uh, of long-term uh, part storage? So that, that's a good question. Uh, there, there's a lot of factors in regards to, to tin whiskers. Uh, and as we, we talked about earlier, the, the exact mechanisms, you know, aren't really well known. You know, there's a, there's a complex relationship of, of factors there. Um, could they play a part? Sure. Do we definitively know? You know, it's hard to say. Um, you know, unfortunately, I kind of have to leave it there because I, I can't give you a, a yes or no answer to that question. Um, but it's it's a good question. Um, you know, with any parts that are in, in storage, you know, they should be handled um, in accordance with industry standards for, uh, you know, open open time and, and floor life, uh, you know, namely uh, J standard 33. I want to add to that, Peter, just a little bit, because, you know, in, in one of NASA's papers, they talked about tin whiskers and they actually did the experiment in space and and we're able to grow the tin whiskers there so i'm i'm gonna say that uh if moisture is a contributor it's not the only contributor <laughs> uh because they were able to see tin whiskers in space so there's not much moisture in space yeah no, it's, it's a great point dan and and that that citation that that dan is talking about um there's actually been satellites lost due to uh tin whiskers so um Okay. Um, do you have a list of pre-produced EOL, EOL parts 
and available to share. Um, and how does RE decide on which EOL, EOL part to get the license for reproduction from the manufacturer? And can we as individual firms request RE to consider? Okay, I'll, I'll take that and run because uh, absolutely, uh, it, you know, there, there, over, over time here at Rochester, uh, porting a product from one fab to another or continuing manufacturing of a product comes from two places. It comes from end customers, but we've also, we've also done that on behalf of the OCMs directly. So we've gotten the requests coming from both places and, and for different reasons at different times. An end customer can absolutely ask Rochester to go to the semiconductor companies on their behalf and see if a product could be extended. And what I will, what I will say is if you're, if you're attempting to have us do this while you're in and before a last time ship is over, it's not going to happen. And, and don't, don't do that because <laughs> The semiconductor companies want to see a last time ship fully executed before they will entertain doing anything that extends the life of the product. And if this is long after a last time ship, then there's going to be a higher chance of something happening. But we, we react to customer demand. We react to multiple customer demands. So when we see a common thread amongst multiple customers, of course, we're going to do what we can to try to extend the life, uh, but we also we also work directly with the semiconductor companies. You know, part of our investment in plastic assembly is because we see lead frame technologies going away. In general, it's a question of when for what type of package type, but lead frame assemblies in general going away, and and we didn't just make that up and and do that you can you so dips already happened plcc's at asc already went away and and so we're seeing this investment there but that's probably an investment that's going to be taken advantage more by some semiconductor companies as they get package obsolescence rather than end customers so we're we're kind of reacting to both sides the the end user as well as the semiconductor companies directly in our strategies and how we go forward. But we welcome somebody giving us a, a challenge. I, I get about one a day uh, coming in to me saying, hey, what about this? Uh, today's, just for the record, it was the Intel 8085. Uh, I was asked that today. So it, but, but I've been asked lots of more recent products than that. That's just today's example, so. Okay. Um for which lithographies does Rochester typically provide design porting? Hmm. We're driven totally by what the product is. So I, I, I can say that it, it, it depends. Uh, I, I have a guy in my, uh, in my team that always says that it depends. Uh, so I'm going to say that look where product obsolescence is happening today. And that is where we get asked to provide porting services. So it's not going to be on the bleeding edge. It's not going to be in any, anything FinFET. It's going to be all in planar technologies. And then it's going to be a mix of um, bipolar as well as, as CMOS for digital. So analog as well as um, digital things that are portable. Uh, RF, not portable. Flash, not portable. Those kind of things, not portable. Uh, but anything that's uh, digital or analog, may be portable. And um, I'm going to say typically down to today, probably 130 nanometer is about where we are edging into 90 um, because that's where obsolescence is. Um, and then the old stuff too that we, we always get. But I'd say the leading edge of the trailing edge is about 90 nanometer for obsolescence. Okay. Um Question here, um, did not see a uh, treatment of long-term storage of MEMS devices. Do you have any input regarding long-term storage of uh, MEMS? I believe that means microelectromechanical systems. 
So uh, MEMS devices have been, hasn't been included in any of our uh, research so far or studies so far. Uh, we could take that into consideration, uh, you know, going forward, but we, we don't have any data on that at this point in time. I would actually add to that that I, I don't know that MEMS even uh, hits the timeline of obsolescence yet that people, um, maybe they're worried about storage, but I don't know that it really hits what we were targeting. And that was kind of the same place TI was going. And that was 15 year, 20 year type of time frame. What are we looking at? And how many MEMS are really that old right now? Not too many. Uh, they really came in in the last uh, decade. Okay. Um, does Rochester Electronics also provide hybrid assembly solutions? That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, currently uh, we are maturing a uh, mature hybrid design from the, the 70s. Uh, it's comprised of a um, logic die with multiple transistors. Uh, we evaluate uh, future uh, hybrid work on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but we do have the uh, capability to perform assembly in-house for that, um, including, uh, you know, using a mix of eutectic and uh, adhesive attached with uh, substrates, uh, et cetera. So. Okay. Um, is the recommendation to store the components not incorporated into boards for long-term storage, or are the findings similar if components are stored on boards? <clears throat> so that's a that's an interesting question because we don't deal with populated PCBs when it comes to to storage. Um, so that that's something we would have to say that each company would have to evaluate on their own. But the the biggest thing with MSL is that the concern with the is due to the reflow process, right? So if the boards are already populated, um, you know, going through those reflow temperatures in, in profile. Uh, you know, the, the impact as far as popcorning or any sort of in, internal damage to the device is greatly reduced. Um, I, I'll have to leave it at that as far as board storage goes, because that's kind of outside of our, our wheelhouse. Okay. <clears throat> um, do you have any data on parts that are older than 15 years? Uh, yeah, some of the parts that we looked at were up to 17 years old, uh, including some of the ones for electrical test. Um, so with our next phase uh, study that we're working on this year, we're, we're planning on looking at groups from uh, three time periods uh, with that 17 range being up in the uh, upper segment of that. Um, so we do have some data on that on parts of that age, but we looked at, you know, parts from three to 17 years old uh, overall. Okay. Is it better to store wafers versus finished parts for the long term? <laughs> well, uh, so it, it's, that's a tricky question, right? And I'm sure Dan will have a comment on it too. Um, but, you know, in my opinion, it's better to store the wafers because it allows, um, it allows you to build upon demand and you reduce risk. Um, but you could potentially run into other problems such as package obsolescence or uh, lead finish obsolescence, if you will. Um, a lot of companies don't like to deal with tin lead anymore, um, piece part issues, things to that effect. Um, Rochester does have experience working with customers to help them to, to try to mitigate those risks. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to add to that as you predicted, Peter, uh, the, Storing wafer that is associated with a wire bond assembly that doesn't have bisser is, is going to work out just fine. I'm going to say that when you start getting into bumped product and you start getting into built-in self-repair and you start getting into fused options for what makes different products with the same die, it wraps into a complexity of when you try to store the product, has Bisser already been run? Have you already fused the product? The, the problem with built-in self-repair and fusing is that those are very proprietary algorithms and methods that the original component manufacturer holds onto. 
So you would have to know exactly what product you're going to have. Probably Bisser already run, probably the fusing already done, and then store bumped wafer. And and storing bumped wafer is something that we're also we're looking into. We haven't haven't nailed it down yet. I don't think anybody has. Some people are afraid of bumped wafer because of the metallurgy of the bumps and long term people haven't really thought through all of the ramifications possible with bumped wafers. So I'm gonna say that answer spirals into something complicated, John. So sorry about that. All right. Well, we're almost at the top of the hour. I think we have time for one more question, and that is, um, in Europe, does Rochester offer long-term storage services for lifetime buy parts? If yes, where would be where would the components be stored? Right now, we do not store product in Europe. Uh, we haven't had the business um, that would would justify doing that. Um, uh, we can. I don't know that storing it in Europe or storing it in the U.S. makes a uh, uh, a business difference. For for, um, but maybe I could be proven wrong. But we welcome the opportunity to talk to somebody about it in detail. So uh, bring us that discussion and let's talk about it. Okay. Well, I wish we had time for more questions because we start still certainly got more in the queue, but. Um, uh, Unfortunately, we're out of time. So on, on behalf of Military and Aerospace Electronics and Endeavor Business Media, I'd like to thank today, today's presenters, Dan Dice, Vice President of Design Technology at Rochester Electronics, and Peter Crudelli, Manager of Manufacturing Quality Assurance at Rochester. This pres presentation will be available on demand from the Military and Aerospace Electronics website at www.militaryaerospace.com. The link to the archived webinar will be sent to you via email within the next 24 hours. So thanks for coming. I'm John Keller, Chief Editor of Military and Aerospace Electronics. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.